The term cognitive science is of relatively recent creation. It was first occurs in 1973 in a commentary done a report produced by Christopher Longwood Higgins, where he was commenting on the current state of artificial intelligence research. And artificial intelligence was a in the late 60s, early 70s, a very new idea, one which has changed enormously since. Um, and the term was introduced to reflect the need to recognize that questions about human knowing are inherently interdisciplinary. They can only be approached in awareness of the multiplicity of perspectives that we bring to bear on our own being. The logo of the Cognitive Science Society, which was also formed in the 70s, is over there on the right. And you can see around the logo are the names of what at that time was considered to be perhaps the most relevant disciplines. So we have linguistics, neuroscience, philosophy, psychology, anthropology, artificial intelligence, and perhaps surprisingly, education. On the left-hand side, we see a similar attempt, which combines six of those, leaving out education. But one could add more disciplines to this, one could take them away. What's necessary to note is that the concerns of cognitive science are relevant to very many disciplines, and many of the challenges that we face in cognitive science um, lie in constructing an appropriately interdisciplinary conversation in which we make ourselves aware of the assumptions, technical language, formal methods of various disciplines. Now, if the term was first introduced in 1973, the concerns of cognitive science are much, much older than that. And we'll be tracing a course rather conventional in a Western uh, setting, um, looking back to the origins of Western philosophy with the Greeks, briefly, where our main themes will be set up. We'll then skip over 2000 years to around 1600 and Rene Descartes, uh, which is where the first modern philosophy of mind really occurs. And this is around the time of the birth of modern science as well, which is not so long ago. Uh, the philosophy of mind um, will lead us to the figures of um, Hume and Locke and Kant. Um, and many of the basic categories that are employed in discussing the concerns of cognitive science first find articulation in the philosophy of mind in the 17th and 18th centuries. Um, if modern science was born around the time of Descartes, the science of psychology, such as it is, um, was much later in coming and dates no further back than the middle of the 19th century, and we'll be interested in the reasons for that. Um, and since then, of course, these concerns have found elaboration in many disciplines. So neuroscience has been a... Um, an urgent concern. We will possibly have less to say about neuroscience than you might expect in this module, but we will have a lot to say. And then in the middle of the 20th century, there is another scientific revolution with the introduction of information science, the metaphor of the computer, the ability of computers um, to conduct formal reasoning, um, and an explication of the notion of control, which I've listed here as cybernetics. Um, around this time, then, we get the first dreams of an artificial intelligence, which we just noted, and this is where cognitive science first starts to be mentioned. And then we'll be looking also at more recent developments, for the field is very varied uh, and very fast-moving. Um, we'll be looking at artificial neural networks and connectionism, and more recently at embodiment theories of the body. Um, when I first set out to describe this module, I had to circumscribe cognitive science, and that's not easy, as we've just seen. I somewhat reluctantly described it as the relations between minds, brains, and behavior. They may seem unproblematic to you, but of those three, um, two of them are things we don't know where to find. Um, brains, we know, they're in there. Minds, nobody's, we cannot speak with any certainty of the mind. The mind is not an object. Nobody has ever found a mind. Nobody knows what a mind is. Um, we use the word mind to approach our own being in the world in various ways. This is an inherently contested term, and we'll meet many of them as we go along. Behavior might seem straightforward, except that behavior always comes with a characterization in its description 
of a goal which is imposed by the observer. So if I describe your behavior as looting, for example, and we carry on on that basis, um, you can see that my concerns have snuck, snuck in there. If I describe your concerns instead as protesting, then uh, your, your behavior is protesting, then we've got a different object of study. So behaviors are not simply given, they have to be parsed out of the world by an observer. Given that the mental and minds um, are so ill-defined and contested, it's not a big surprise that we find ourselves, when we approach these topics, in heavily contested territory that goes far beyond the bounds of science and even of philosophy. So we find ourselves in much the same theatre as discussion about such notions as spirit, which has played a great role in German philosophy, for example, consciousness, which is a topic we will approach cautiously, the intellect, um, another abstraction that one could construct in various ways, the soul, which may appear to many of you to be uh, a topic ill-suited to scientific study, but the word mind that we now use is just a placeholder for what we used to call soul. Um, and many of the aspects here go back, they make use of concepts that we get from uh, the Greek tradition for the notion of psyche, which underlies psychology, or anima, which is Aristotle's notion of the soul. Um, but the concerns are so general that they go well beyond the concerns of Western science, Western philosophy, and so on. The Atman is a very important concept in Indian philosophy, which bears structural similarity in some respects to the soul. Dasein is a problematic term which has arisen in German uh, phenomenology, um, referring again to, well, something else that we also call experience. Experience is, on one hand, the most familiar thing in the world, is there anything else than experience? On the other hand, making an object of experience turns out to be very, very difficult. With all those complexities, what is cognitive science about? Well, cognition is somehow about knowing. And we're going to unpack that word knowing in many ways. Knowing is, of course, a relationship. One can reify knowledge. We don't have to. Um, the spider knows how to spin a web, but we won't find the knowledge in any explicit form. Um, the relationship of knowing lies between a knower and the known. And as we approach this from various angles, our characterization of the knower is going to change and our characterization of the known is going to change. So that both sides of the subject world relation will need to be explored, explicated, uh, and made more concrete in any given discussion. The very general sense of subject and the very general sense of world lend themselves to more specific elaboration within specific frameworks. In philosophy, the discipline concerned with knowledge is that of epistemology. And to some extent, cognitive science sets out as a, a scientific end of epistemology, studying using the scientific methods, the questions that arise, as, our, as we interrogate the relationship between the knower and the known. And in that general framework, then there are certain oppositions that recur again and again. We'll become very familiar with these. The, the notion of change versus the notion of state. State seems to describe a snapshot, a static description of how something is at a determinate point in time, whereas in fact everything is always changing all the time. So we've got this contrast between dynamic processes and state-based descriptions. Um, within the philosophy of mind, there's a long-running um, set of concerns which can be expressed as the tension between rationalism, which prioritizes reason, uh, the notion of ideas, and abstraction from empiricism, which emphasizes the role of our sensory motor embedding in the world, the role of the senses in getting knowledge. Rationalists' approaches tend to favor certain knowledge. Empiricists tend to look on knowledge as probabilistic. And if some subject knows some worlds, the manner in which that knowledge should be understood can be developed in various ways. Some of these make use of what we might call representations. If I have a page of equations and I say, that's my knowledge about the, a system, then I've represented the system on, the, on that page of equations. 
not all representations lie in the on the page, of course, and various theories see a role for representation, for example, in patterns of neural firing. And against these, there are those who point out that we could do better or we will find different insights if we understand knowledge not uh, in this explicit representational sense. Think of the spider and its web again. Um, just what we are studying um, is sufficiently ill-defined right now that it's not clear whether we're talking about an individual person or collective knowledge. So we make frequently make use of such ideas as collective knowledge, collective skills, collective memory. And indeed, as we'll see, um, there are problems with trying to characterize the person uh, as if they existed independent of all their attachments to the world and independent of other people. So there's always a tension between individualist and collective accounts. And, and a major theme which will emerge in this module is that the person should not be regarded as an already given fixed entity. But in our inquiry, in the manner in which we set up questions and then go to address them, we are in a sense constructing a picture of the person. And this picture is always subject to the negotiation. So we won't regard the person as fixed. And all this lands us in squarely metaphysical territory. Now, metaphysics is uh, out of fashion at the moment. Um, metaphysical questions bear a close similarity to theological questions, questions of belief. Um, metaphysics is prior to physics. It is the set of framing assumptions about the nature um, of reality uh, that lead your inquiry. So there are many, many kinds of monism, which assume there's only one kind of stuff. And then we might talk about is that matter or is that spirit or what is that there are dualist frameworks within which we clearly try to separate for example the mental from the physical and then there are pluralist or pragmatic frameworks which try to avoid being too determinate about such issues for metaphysical questions don't result in answers <laughs> um, our approach here will be strongly pluralistic so this is the landscape over which we are going to roam as we come at the human person from a variety of directions. And we will try to avoid um, treating it as a team sport. These oppositions are not questions with answers. We're not asked to come down on one side or another and say human knowing is one or other thing. What we are going to try to do is to develop the sensitivity to understand that questions about human knowing contain within them these tensions. And with that, we'll go on to the next lecture, which was the next video, which was um, start back at the ancient Greeks.